Hi everyone. This is a discussion of how we would make this molecule, whose key feature is this strain cycloalkyne, which can be used for bioorthogonal click chemistry. This is in fact a molecule that was made by Carolyn Batozzi and her research group. Batozzi, of course, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2022. So why do we want this strain cycloalkyne? Well, it's because it can really easily do cycloadditions with an azide, that's a pericyclic reaction there, and click these molecules together really easily. The products of the cycloaddition is this super stable aromatic heterocycle. This is a triazole. But the key point is that we've just stitched the two molecules together really cleanly with no other byproducts. In fact, these types of azide alkyne cycloadditions were also developed by the other two Nobel laureates, Sharpless and Meldal, who worked out very clean ways of making the reaction work in the presence of copper one salts to give good regioselectivity. But the key change here is that if we have a strained cycloalkyne instead, it's super reactive. It's got some really weak bonding, so there's a huge enthalpic driving force to swap the alkyne and the azide and convert them to the aromatic product. So this chemistry doesn't even need the copper one catalysis, and this really expands the scope of what you can do with click chemistry. Copper one is quite cytotoxic in biological systems in that it kills cells in low concentration, but here we have a reaction that doesn't need the copper one anymore. Now, alkynes and azides aren't very common in biological systems, so they don't tend to do many other reactions with other biological molecules. The azides and the alkynes hang around until they find each other, and then they do click chemistry together. This is what is meant by bioorthogonal, as in these reactions can occur inside living systems without interfering with any other biochemical processes. Just having a look at some of the other features here, the alkyne is flanked by these aryl groups. Now, they're there to increase the strain on the alkyne, by making that eight-membered ring really sp2 rich, so forcing bond angles of 120 degrees and preventing puckering. We also have an amide at the top, which will also go some way to increase strain on the alkyne. I think that CN bond might be slightly twisted. If that CN bond is kept in the plane, for example, the whole system would be 16 pi anti-aromatic, which again increases the reactivity of the alkyne. So this whole system is geared up to make the alkyne super reactive, and it reacts with the azide really, really quickly and importantly, really quickly on a biochemical timescale. Now this unit at the top with the heterocycle and the benzene ring is a linker unit that allows us to attach a fluorescent probe, for example, to our cycloalkyne, and so it can get carried around in the same place. So we could use that hydroxyl group to do some carbonyl chemistry and attach any fluorescent probe we like. So now wherever the strained alkyne goes, the fluorescent tag will go with it. If the alkyne finds an azide and does the really quick click reaction, the fluorescent tag will get permanently fixed to the biological molecule that we're trying to investigate, which I've abbreviated quite aggressively as an R group here. Now that's why we'd want this molecule, but how can we make it? The rest of this discussion is inspired by a research paper by Potosi and her group, which I've linked in the description below this video. What I aim to do here is explain some of the disconnection logic for making something like this, but the full details of the conditions can be found in the paper. Now, as always, we've got to target the most reactive thing first. We don't want to be carrying that around forever. It will get destroyed by loads of reagents outside of a biological system. The key chemistry for forming a carbon-carbon pi bond is the same as it normally is. We can do some sort of elimination chemistry. So we need to get to the alkene, and we need to make sure we have two substituents on here, an X and a Y, which can be permanently removed. Note that we're doing a syn elimination here, and one of them has to be a leaving group, and we have to have something that attacks the other one. In this research, what I've labelled Y will be the leaving group, and what I've labelled X will be the group that's attacked. We definitely need to be quite forceful here. So the leaving group that was chosen is one of the best in organic chemistry in the triflate, which is a sulfonate-based group here. It has a pKAH of around minus 14 if you use the standard extrapolation for non-aqueous systems. And then we need something for X. If we're going to do an E2 type elimination, we would use a hydrogen there and a strong base. But a far more reactive system is to install a trimethylsilyl group there, because then I could use a fluoride minus to attack the silicon, encourage it to stop bonding to the other carbon, and follow through to an elimination reaction. So that's all well and good for a clean reaction to make the alkyne at the end. But we've also introduced here a new functional group, which is quite reactive in the vinyl triflate. Now these are quite easy to make by trapping an enol form of a ketone. So for example, if I could make this enol, I could treat this with triflic anhydride as a powerful electrophile and make my vinyl triflate quite easily. Now, because we're coming from an enol form, this is really helpful for synthesis because I can disconnect back to a ketone with the acidic proton nearby. A carbonyl group is probably the most versatile functional group for making complex molecules. Now, of course, there's a slight problem here in that we've been carrying around this hydroxyl group up here. 
which would get triflated too under these conditions, which is a real pain. I don't really want to be messing around with protecting groups here. So really what we need to do is not get distracted by the fancy vinyl triflate and just go back a step and just disconnect off this linker at a different stage. So I'll do that now, identifying that actually we can break the molecule in the middle, which is always a good idea for vector synthesis. Some arrows like these ones in green show that we could do another pericyclic reaction there. To do a reaction that's very similar to the traditional click reaction and stitch those two together by cycloaddition as well. So actually what I need to go back to is this alkene here. The vinyl triflate is stable enough, probably not to some acid, but we're not proposing doing that anyway. I can react the alkene with this nitrile oxide, which is just a classic 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition. All the other functional groups are tolerated by this. We just need to mix it up and maybe heat it a bit. The regio selectivity there is probably controlled on sterics, pointing that tiny oxygen onto the bigger side of the alkene. So now we can retrosynthesize both of these in turn and add some convergency to our synthesis. We've already said the vinyl triflate should go back to a ketone, which now is just this one on the bottom left-hand corner. And the nitrile oxide may be a less familiar one to disconnect, but we can just do some sort of elimination reaction again to form the triple bond. One possible way of doing this would be to go back to this oxime that's got a chlorine on it, because that chloride is particularly prone to elimination to form a triple bond, probably along this lines. And then I can just lose the acidic proton that's at the top. Well, how would I get the chloride on? Well, I'd need to do some sort of nucleophilic attack onto a chlorine source. I need some sort of chlorine electrophile. So something that would work really well here as a reasonably easy to handle chlorine source would just be N-chlorosuccinamide, also known as NCS, which we could attack using the oxime, using these sorts of arrows, and then tautomerize back to the CN double bond. Now I've run out of space on this slide, so I'll come back to that oxime later. Essentially, the standard way to make oxymes will work. We need to disconnect that back to an aldehyde and do a condensation of hydroxylamine. And then we're back to a cheap, readily available starting material. But first, we need to continue disconnecting the other component with the eight-membered ring. Making medium-sized rings is notoriously difficult. And this one's probably even worse than normal, given all the bond angles involved. But the fact that we've got two carbonyl groups now gives us an option that we didn't have before, and that's to do a reconnection. And what I'm going to do is join these two carbons together across here, because if I do so, I'll get two five-membered rings, which should be much easier to make. If I take that back to a CC double bond, we should be able to do some oxidative cleavage reaction to reveal the dicarbonyl. So here's my two five-membered rings. Here are the two carbons that were circled in green before, and the proposal is to put a CC double bond in the middle. And what have we got left? Well, at the bottom, there's just a silyl group, and at the top, we've got a nitrogen with an allyl group on it. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that we've actually generated a new functional group here, that, which really clues into how we finish this synthesis. This disconnection goes back to an indole, and there are loads of ways of making them. We have those pesky side chains though, the allyl group and the silyl group. We could get both of them on by substitution type reactions. That's because we've got some readily available electrophilic reagents for those groups in allyl bromide and trimethyl silyl chloride. We'll have a think about the order in the forward synthesis. Okay, and now we've just got a plain indole, which is fused to the indine. It's much easier to make the indole because the heteroatom can help us. And we can just use a Fischer indole synthesis here. Now specifically that disconnects across these two to give me this ketone to represent the left-hand side of the molecule. This is actually called one indenone. And for the right-hand side of the molecule, well, I just need phenyl hydrazine. Both of these starting materials are cheap and readily available. And to go backwards, I can just use the normal Fischer indole synthesis conditions, which is mix them together in acid and heat them up. I'll just quickly point out the mechanism because it might not be obvious how that disconnection works in this particular case. I start with the indenone and I activate it towards electrophilic attack with the acid. At this point, the unconjugated nitrogen lone pair of the hydrazine can attack into the carbonyl. And after a little bit of proton transfer, we can condense to form the imine by kicking out water. Under acidic conditions, this imine can tautomerize because the pKa of that proton is quite low into an enamine form. And now we're set up for a sigmatropic rearrangement, specifically a 3-3-1, where we can break the weak nitrogen-nitrogen sigma bond to quickly rearomatize before anyone notices to give this amine, which then can just cyclize under acidic conditions to extend the aromaticity. So just swapping around a few protons and losing an ammonia molecule overall. This gives me the product that I need in my synthesis. 
So just before we go through a proposal for the forward synthesis, we should just check out the chemistry of this molecule. We needed to do two substitution reactions. And to do so, we probably want to exploit these two different protons here. If we can deprotonate those in turn, we can form an anion and just do a simple substitution reaction with an electrophile. But there's actually an issue. Both of those hydrogen atoms, because they can form conjugated systems, have quite similar pKa's. For reference, that's round about 20 for both of them. We're going to need to be quite careful in our forward synthesis to work out how we pick one of them over the other. So let's have a go at that forward synthesis. I'm starting off with this one indenone as my starting material. At the time of recording, you can get 100 grams of this for 240 US dollars from your usual chemical suppliers. But it's got quite a low molecular weight, so you're getting quite a lot for this. This is about three quarters of a mole. We're going to react this with phenylhydrazine in the presence of acid, and then we're going to heat it up to give us the fused indole indine. And now we need to find a way to differentiate the protons. Well, the way that was developed by Potosi and her research group was to exploit the fact that that NH bond is much more polar than the CH bond on the indine. It was possible to selectively deprotonate using a biphasic mixture and a phase transfer catalyst. So this is when we have two solvents that aren't miscible in each other, but we keep the reagent, like potassium hydroxide, in the aqueous layer, and we keep the electrophile and the starting material in the organic layer. If we add a phase transfer catalyst, like tetrabutyl ammonium bromide, that's a classic for this type of thing, we can get the reactivity that we require on the interface between the organic and the aqueous phase of this set of reaction conditions. You can, of course, increase the rate of this reaction by stirring it pretty hard. Vigorous stirring will increase the surface area contact between the emissible solvents. Now we've got the allyl group on, we, of course, don't need to worry too much about removing the other acidic proton. So we could just go in with a standard strong base that will irreversibly and completely deprotonate it easily, such as butyl lithium. And then we can just trap the anion with trimethylsilyl chloride. So to be clear, what we're doing here is deprotonating and doing a substitution at silicon. And then now comes a particularly funky step that the Potosi paper doesn't comment on very much. And that's the oxidation of the CC bond in the middle. We want to do an oxidation of a CC double bond to give us our dicarbonyl, but we've also got a second one at the top. This one is less electron rich. So we should be able to get some reactivity difference if we use an electrophilic type oxidizing agent. You probably get some difference in reaction using ozone, for example, but I think it would be too fast for this system. So although we'll get our eight membered ring, we'd also end up with an aldehyde dangling off. Rather surprisingly, it was found that using MCPPA, slightly buffered with sodium bicarbonate, is actually able to do the required transformation and form the dicarbonyl, but the dangling allyl group is left untouched. It doesn't even form an epoxide here. Forming the dicarbonyl will of course have a really strong driving force because carbonyl bonds are strong, and that driving force is presumably making this reaction much easier than the epoxidation. So it will also have a lower activation energy barrier. Mechanism wise, well, I've got my per acid and I've got an indole. I figure the indole probably reacts in its normal way out of its free position because it's like an enamine to pick up an oxygen and break the weak oxygen oxygen bond. So now we've generated a positively charged electrophilic species in that aminium ion. There are two nucleophiles that could be floating around right now. We could have the carboxylate coming in and trapping out to form the aminal, but I don't think we get anywhere if we do this. And this would be reversible anyway. But there is, of course, more of the per acid kicking around. Some of it could well be deprotonated because of the sodium carbonate being present. And we could use this as a nucleophile instead. This, of course, allows us to oxidize for a second time. And in this molecule, we've generated a pattern that's quite common in organic chemistry in that we've got a leaving group here as a sink of electron density. We have a hydroxyl group here as a source of electron density. They're three atoms apart, so we're perfectly set up for a fragmentation. That will both have an entropic driving force of one molecule going to two and a very strong enthalpic driving force in forming two carbonyls at once from a starting material which is pretty sterically crowded around those atoms labelled one and two. So we've really stacked the deck there thermodynamically to make the awkward eight-membered ring product. But that's the game you always have to play to make interesting molecules and particularly ones that are really functional for us. Next, we need to make the vinyl triflate, which will just be easier if we just fully deprotonate that acidic proton using a strong base to generate the enolate. Luckily, triflic anhydride is very oxyphilic, so it will trap out a triflate on the oxygen and give us the vinyl triflate that we want. The strong base used in the paper is potassium HMDS. This is a bit like LDA's bigger brother, but it has some advantages here. The potassium cation floating around won't solvate the oxygen minus center very much, 
which increases its reactivity with the triflic anhydride. Next, we need the linker component to do the nitrile oxide cycloaddition. Just moving into the little box, a cheap and readily available starting material is this dialdehyde, which are para on a benzene ring. This has got a really hard name for me to pronounce. It's called terephalaldehyde. Presumably, it's cheap because of its use in polymer chemistry. At the time of recording, you, you can buy this for 150 US dollars for half a kilo. That's approximately 3.7 moles. I can do a statistical reduction of one of the aldehyde functional groups with sodium borohydride, provided I make sodium borohydride the limiting reagent and the dialdehyde is in excess. I should be able to isolate this mono-reduced product, which is exactly what we need for the formation of the oxime. So next, just treating it with hydroxylamine, presumably a little bit of acid will help us here. We can form the oxime, which as we said, we can treat with N-chlorosuccinamide to increase the oxidation level of the carbon to this chloride, which is unstable to heating. And it'll take us to our nitrile oxide as and when we need it by an elimination reaction. Right, I'm running a bit out of space, so I'm just going to label that chloride as species A, and I can go back to my main synthesis. All I need to do is add that reagent and heat it up with the other intermediate, and then we'll get the cycloaddition on the allyl group, just abbreviating the aromatic system there as well. And we've got one final step, that's to finally form the strained alkyne. We need something that forcibly attacks the silicon, removes it from the molecule to promote elimination of the really good triflate leaving group, a really good clean source of fluoride that will be good for this reaction would be cesium fluoride. If you enjoyed the discussion, please do consider giving the video a like and subscribing to my channel. I have another video about the use of the click reaction in organic electronics that might be of interest and I've just linked it on the screen now.